I want you to visualize that you lived, I don't know, thousands of years ago in some society. And when you lived in that society, you had a neighbor. And your neighbor knocked on your door one day and he says to you, um, an angel came to my house. He told me that I'm the messenger of God and that I'm supposed to deliver this message to all of mankind. I've already delivered it to my family and they've rejected me. And since you're my neighbor, the right of the neighbor is that I tell you. And by the way, I'm a messenger of God and everything I say isn't actually my own words. They're words of who? Of God, of the, of the divine. Let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, they're words of Allah. And following me actually doesn't mean that you're following me. It means you're obeying Allah. There are two problems with this statement. The neighbor who opens the door and listens to all of this says, wait, so first of all, you're asking me to believe that an angel talked to you? That God speaks to you? You're my neighbor that I've known for 20 years? And this is hard enough to believe, but on top of that, you want me to change everything about my life based on every word you say? Two things that are very hard to do. One, to believe that, especially when your own family says you're what? You're crazy. Your own family says you're crazy and you want me to believe you. And I'm not, not only should I believe what you're saying, I should follow you in everything that you do. And as the more I follow you, the more people not just call you crazy, who else are they going to call crazy? They're going to call me crazy. Um, I'll think about it, thanks. I'll close the door. And I, I'm giving this to you because the messengers of, of Islam, the messengers of Allah that were sent to different nations, we know that they gave da'wah to their people, but it's not like our da'wah. We have it easy. We're in the millions. We're in the millions. It's easy. When you're the only one who believes something in an entire city, you know what you are? You're crazy. What did the people call the messengers? Have you ever read? What did they call them? Insane. They called them insane. You say, oh, those evil people, they call them crazy, they call them insane. How could they do that? Put yourself in their shoes. How easy is it to accept if no one around you believes? If no one around you, everybody around you is a skeptic. No one believes. This is a very, very difficult thing to believe. It's not easy. The Sahaba are the best of people, the best generation for a reason. Their iman was the hardest bridge to cross. When someone takes the shahada today, it's way easier than the bridge they had to cross. Much, much more difficult. And the hardest, the hardest of all is the work of the Messenger himself. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because you know, Allah chose the most intelligent people on the face of this earth to be His messengers. They're the most intelligent people and they're smart enough to know that when they go around knocking doors and telling people that they get revelation from God, what should they anticipate practically? They should anticipate that people are going to say that they're insane. They're going to lose their credibility. People are going to laugh at them, even hurt them, even be annoyed with them. They'll lose the touch, touch with their families. That's all going to happen. A smart people can figure, person can figure that out for himself. They knew this going into this message, but they didn't have a choice. Because they didn't take this up as a hobby. This was given to them as a responsibility. They had no choice in the matter. Put in this impossible position these messengers, alayhim wa salam, and to help them, and only to help them deliver this message, Allah would give these messengers something that would make their claim more believable. What was that thing? The miracles. Allah would give His messengers miracles so that the skeptics would be quiet, silenced. So the reason for not believing Him is not that they didn't see any proof. The reason is, I'm too arrogant to follow Him. That's the only reason left. The reason isn't intellectual anymore. That's the only reason left. And how do you eliminate the first reason, the intellectual problem? You eliminate it by giving the people something that can only be from Allah. It can't be from a human being. It can't be the product of the human mind. It can't be creation. It has to be something beyond. It can't be something that can just occur naturally. You see? Which is why when we read about the, the miracles of different prophets, the blind person being able to see again, the dead coming back to life, the clay bird turning into a living bird, all of these things are clear signs that this man is not talking on his own behalf. He's speaking on behalf of Allah Azza wa Jal. But Allah gave this nation the ultimate miracle of all. He gave this nation, this Muslim Ummah, and for the rest of mankind, He gave them Qur'an. The, the staunch difference between Qur'an and all the other miracles is what? 
All the other miracles were for the eyes to see. You could see a dead guy come back to life. You could see it. You could see the body of water parting. You could see that. But the Qur'an was not for the eyes. The Qur'an was for what? You see something, it penetrates your heart. That's what the previous messengers. With the Qur'an, إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا What is Allah saying? Listen. Listen to it. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ ضُرِبَ مَثَلٌ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Listen to it carefully. Listen to this Qur'an. It's a miracle for the ears. It's different. All the other miracles were for what? The eyes. This is, this, when I was explaining this to my fifth grade classroom back in the day, one of my students, I repeat this often, he said, Oh man! I said, what happened? He said, it's not fair, Brother Numan. I was like, what's not fair? He said, all those other prophets got such cool stuff. <laughs> we just got a book. I know it sounds blasphemous, but he's got a point. It is different. We do claim that a book sitting on the shelf in the masjid is the, the ultimate miracle of God, the ultimate miracle of, Quran, of Islam, the proof of Islam, sitting on each bookshelf, this mushaf. So there has to be some basis that has to be explored. On what basis do we make this claim? And why subhanahu wa ta'ala, he changed the direction of the miracles. He didn't make it something for the eyes to see. When people saw the water parting, they told their children about it. I saw it with my own eyes, the kids are listening. Then their kids told their kids, and their kids told their kids. Until it passed down to us, and we tell our kids at Sunday school, Hey, by the way, Musa alayhi salam, what did he do? Oh, he passed the water, yeah, something about water, yeah. It's just a story now. For the people who were there, was it just a story? No, it was a miracle. But for the people after them, it's just a matter of faith. It's not a miracle to them. It's a, it's a matter of faith, but not of a... Miracle. Because a miracle is something you could see, something you can experience, something you could taste. So now the atheist comes, the disbeliever comes to the Christian or to the Jew, and he says to him, you believe Jesus turned you know, uh, the dead guy back to life, or you know, the, the bird came back to life, things like that. You believe that? He says, yes. He said, why? Because the Bible says so. He says, were you there when it happened? Did anybody record it? Is it on YouTube? Why do you believe it? What does the Christian say? It's in my heart. That's all he has to say. The, the same atheist, the same kafir, the same disbeliever comes to the Muslims. You believe the Quran is the word of God? Yeah. Oh yeah? So uh, did you see the angel come down? No, no I didn't. So how do you know that it's the word of God? Well let's come study the Quran, let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you why this can't be human. That next part where I say let me show you, that's what we need to know. We need that part. For ourselves and for others. We really need it for ourselves because there's no boost in Iman like the boost you get when you experience a miracle of Allah. There's nothing like it. And we need that to be able to illustrate it to others because then they, the question will probe them. They won't go to sleep at night. Man, I didn't come up with an answer to that guy. I gotta look this up. I have a friend who was an atheist who would go around MSA programs all over the country just to mess with the speakers. <laughs> right? And he would go and ask them questions, ask them questions, and until he came to one shaykh, and he gave him a miracle of Qur'an. And he said, oh yeah, well, I'll do my research. And he did his research, and he did his research, and he did his research. He couldn't find anything until he had to give up, literally give up, and he took the shahada. And he says, when I say I'm Muslim, you know what Muslim means, what, right? The one who submits? He said, I literally submitted. I had to, I gave up. I couldn't do, I couldn't fight anymore. <laughs> said, I, I, couldn't, I didn't have anywhere else to go. SubhanAllah. That is the thing that we need to revive. That is something that we need to appreciate. I'll just give you one example. One example of the Qur'an as a profound miracle. From the literary point of view. Now you guys have taken literature classes, right? You've taken Shakespeare. You've taken, you know, the Plato's Republic you've read. You've read the Odyssey, right? You've read all this stuff. I won't call it garbage. It's everything has some benefit, but whatever. You've read this stuff. These are the landmarks of world literature, the products, the ultimate products of the human mind, right? Our belief is that the Qur'an is the ultimate literature. Compared to any language, the Qur'an is the ultimate literature. But that's a subjective thing. If you're literature students, I think this is a science school, but literature is not objective, it is what? It's subjective. 
So you say it's beautiful, I say it's ugly, right? You like that poem, I, li- I don't like that poem. You like this song, I don't like that song. Don't listen to songs, but I'm saying. Okay? Or you like this painting, I don't like that painting. It's subjective. So you could argue that literature is what? It's subjective. But I began by saying Allah says that the Qur'an is balagh. It is a means of communication. And the point, the purpose of communication is to influence the audience. So we will judge what is better literature by what? What's the, what's, the, what's the measuring stick? What influence does it have? What impact does it have on the world? What change does it cause? How does it change people? How does it influence behavior? How does it modify people's behavior? How does it command over people? That will be the judge. That's a practical judge of the power of any speech, any literature. You could say it's wonderful, but I, don't, I, don't, I think it's just fiction. Or you could say it's wonderful and it's changed my life, the way I live. And if you study this fact historically, no society went through a transformation based on a single text. The way in which the Muslims went through, with what? With the Qur'an. No society in human civilization, never. And in how many years did that society get transformed? 23 years. This is even Orientalists agree. Okay, the Qur'an is being claimed as revelation. I won't say it is revelation from the kafir's point of view, we know it's revelation. He says it's being claimed as revelation at his age of 40, and it stops at the age of what? 63, 23 years. In 23 years, this man starts at single, single-handedly, sing, one person. And by the end of these 23 years, what change have these words and this man, this speaker, this speech, and this style of speech, what have they influenced? You see, the way people eat, did it change? The way people sleep, did that change? Did the way people deal with their family change? Did the way people schedule their day change? Did the way people speak to each other change? Did the way they do business change? Did the way they go to the bathroom change? Did the way they dress change? The question isn't what changed. You know what the question is? What didn't change? Everything changed. Everything changed. Whenever there's quote-unquote revolution in society, it's either economic or it's political, right? It's a, there's a political change, there's an economic change, there's a military change. But the way people live on a day-to-day basis, that doesn't change. They don't change the way they deal with their families depending on the government changing or a new system coming into power. That's still the same, they're still the same person. But this change that the Qur'an brought, unparalleled in human history, what exactly changed wasn't just societal, wasn't just on the macro level, it even changed the way people think. Changed everything, everything, from the very individual level to the collective level. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. If you enjoyed this video, please do share it with friends and family. If you want to see more videos from this series, click on the box at the top. If you want to see other videos, click on the box at the bottom. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks.